previously on Get in the Mecca. I think we need to move to a place where we're going beyond just calling something smooth and ending the conversation because smooth is not the peak of animation. There isn't really a peak per se as to what it should be. Such animations, everything from <laughs> how they move their hands to how they walk around the room is a sign to some extent as to how they patch up or even just show what they're going through. I'm Jamal, and you're listening to Guess in the Mecca, your weekly anime and manga analysis podcast. From inspiring arcs to game-changing cinematography, I'm on a journey to try and make sense of it all, episode by episode. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to Guess in the Mecca, and in today's episode we are going to try and look at form in anime and animation and see what we can understand from it when it comes to storytelling in anime. This is an episode which I've wanted to do for a while, but I didn't really know how to execute on it, but I finally found that that's what I want to do today. I want to try and discuss why form is important for our understanding of certain narratives and what it does and who allows this to happen. I'm specific. This is going to be one of those episodes where I do talk about specific animators and the goal is to just try and learn about it a bit more and really establish uh, or just have some takeaways for looking at stories going forward. For those who are new to the podcast, I'm Jamal. I like to look at anime on a slightly more analytical level. Whether it is that deep it is up for interpretation, but that's how we do it here on this podcast. So let's just hop into the podcast now. This is episode 87 of the show. A look at form in anime. Before we start, I like to usually talk about spoilers and spoiler warnings in case there are any, and in this case there actually shouldn't be. I'm going to be talking very heavily about the actual animation and stuff like that and the more technical things rather than the plot. I will be referencing the plots which I'll be discussing, and just for your information, I'm going to be talking about Your Name, The Millennium Actress, Ping Pong, and then a few short films and music videos here and there. So going to try and keep it very light uh, or just no spoilers at all because this is a technical related episode and I want to get some value out of these things rather than talking about it only and exclusively through the lens of the plot within the anime. So what exactly do I mean when I'm referring to form? To me and kind of in my own words, form represents size, shape and ultimately the composition of the body, when we are talking about the body that is. How we portray it, it says a lot about what the thing it's in is trying to convey and I think that that's why it's such an important topic. It's a very hard one as well to because it does get very theoretical and it's hard to talk about it in practice I think. But I think when we do do so, it's very good for understanding the, the work that we're watching a, a lot better. In this episode and analysis, I'm going to try and keep it restricted to the human body. I do understand that there are loads of other things that come into form and anime relationship with realism and so many other things as well. And so I'm going to keep it to the human body just because I think it will be more productive to talk about that specifically rather than talk about all these other things which form is involved in as a theme, not really as a theme but as a, an idea within anime. With that being said, I do encourage you to look further beyond just the human body when it comes to analysing form and why it's important within animation because there are a lot of things and anime is a great way, an example of so many ways of going against the grain when it comes to form and stuff like that. So it's this analysis is limited to the human body mostly, but that isn't to say that the entire thing and the entire concept of form is limited to the human body. In order to really understand form and why it's important, we have to establish kind of what is normative and what is maybe not normative. 
I know that this on first glance can sound problematic, but it isn't, I promise. Uh, I'm not talking about a normal body type. That's not how it works, and I don't believe that there is one. What I'm talking about when it comes to normative is more of normal human motion and a normal portrayal of human motion. Something I pointed out when it came to the Wonder Egg Priority character acting episode, which I would recommend checking out before even checking this, uh, this episode. I even wrote an article about it as well on the blog too. But when I say normal, I mean motion that we can relate to. Things, the way in which we move is how characters move in shows like Wonder Egg Priority and others as well, which really put realism at the core of it. But when we look at another show like Ping Pong the Animation, the goal isn't really entirely to move like we do and to relate to us, but to express emotions through the form and through the body by distorting it and by increasing and decreasing the size of certain parts. Just to cycle back to that point on quote-unquote normal forms, I think this is, uh, as I just said, it's stuff we can relate to, things that we consider real or we can conceive as real. There's no sense of exaggeration or something to be more than the real or just less real. Its goal is to mirror and match what we already do. And that's what makes it so beautiful at times when we have some of the scenes which I'll be talking about in, later into the episode. When we have these things, they can make one feel very immersed because you, you can almost see yourself doing it and you understand the struggle. You can, as I said, you can relate to the struggle when someone falls onto the floor in a very feasible way. You can understand the pain for their fall and also just going through the process of getting up and things like that. Weird analogy, but I hope you get what I'm trying to say, that realism is quite important for understanding forms, and we'll get very in-depth when it comes to this. But with this logic, we can kind of also understand what isn't normal, or not really normal, but what isn't normative, and that's when we get into things like exaggeration, and going beyond or regressing from the real. It's very much on a spectrum and it's much more nuanced than this is real and this isn't real and this form is exaggerated as in the character, uh, this form is exaggerated versus the other that isn't. But there are still some pretty nice contrasts and differences amongst anime as a whole because there are so many different works out there that take different strategies and approaches when it comes to animating the human body and stuff like that. I've been speaking very theoretically, I understand that, and so I think it's about time that we stepped away from theory and actually kind of go into practice or some actual examples of how form is represented. And for that, we have to look at not just anime, but the people that make anime happen, which is why we are taking a look at some very specific animators this episode. Usually we do split up the animators into sections and I am doing that this week. This week I'm splitting them into two groups and I call the first group the Form Conformers. Uh, that sounds like a really weird team name, <laughs> but the Form Conformers and then we have the Form Distorters. These categories are bound to be not very straightforward, but the goal is just to get somewhat of an understanding of what they're trying to do and what they often do, rather than, you know, mixing up in the grey and then it just gets very confusing. So our first category, as I said, are the form conformers. And who are the people who I put in this category? I put two animators here. I put Hiroyuki Okiura and Toshiyuki Inoue. These two animators were probably the two that really got me into character acting animation and enjoying it a lot more and appreciating it because they were so good at doing it. <laughs> they opened my eyes up to an approach to animation that puts realism at the core of it. It's how we move which reflect it is reflected within how characters move because representing the human experience is what is necessary through character acting like this. And I think a great place to start when it comes to looking at Inoue and Okiura and their skill in terms of composing the human body and such and how they represent how it moves is through looking at their running animation. So let's talk about the work of Toshiki Inoue first. 
One of my favorite running scenes from Inoue comes from the film Markia when she's running from, well, she being Markia, the characters running from this massive dragon. Inoue animates both of them as well, but I'm going to focus very specifically on the person running. By the way, there are Sakuburo links if you want to reference the actual thing I'm talking about. I'm going to try and talk about it again based on the features rather than, oh, when it's moving like this because I'm not looking at the video myself. One thing I noticed was how they pay a lot of attention to how the hair moves and it's funny because we spoke about animators like Hironori Tanaka who pay a lot of attention to hair and how it moves in this well, I want to say in a bit of a hyper real sort of sense in the way it all fragments and things like that which is something we're not very used to in anime and in a way it doesn't go that far as say Tanaka because the point is to keep it within the bounds of the real. So the hair went moving and when she's trying to get past the dragon as it's putting its feet forwards, her hair flaps upwards and it curls almost backwards as she's running and then it flops back down again. It's a very subtle thing but it's realistic and I think that's the point. One thing I also found cool was that it's also very affected by the wind and vibrations that the dragon is causing as well. So that also comes back to this thing on why is realism important. It adds to the immersion and the convincingness of the scene. I think a lot of our points regarding realism will bounce back to the fact that it is convincing and convincingness makes us feel more immersed. <laughs> Making us more immersed I think is the point of a film that <laughs> takes on these sort of things. I think this scene is a lot more menacing and frightening here and it's my favorite scene within the entire movie and I'm pretty sure it's, it's in it's in like the first 15 minutes or so it's not that far in at all but it's it's stunning because it's it's what really got me into the film it reminds you that this is although it is a fantasy film nonetheless the goal of a fantasy is to try and convince you that this fantasy world to some extent exists and is although not possible in our real world can be tangible within this fictional world and by animating this realistic fashion as Inoue does a lot of the time we're reminded of that message. The same goes for Inoue's cut on the Millennium Actress. We still have to talk about Okira so I'm not going to spend too much time with the Millennium Actress but they have another running cut which is also pretty famous as well where Chiyoko is running around the corner through what seems like a town in, in the snow. And I love how he represents, again, realistic running by changing how Chiyoko sways as she turns the corner. She just has all these different ways of striding through the snow when she's <laughs> running to get to her destination. And that is so cool, honestly. It shows so much research has been done and reference and things like that. I know Inoue is extremely talented already. Uh, so the extent of that is something that I'm not too sure of. I'm not going to try and confirm but from what it looks like it it seems as if there's been a lot of close paying of attention to real life real life running and how we run basically everything from how we place our hands when we stride to when we get more tired and then they move outwards and things like that uh, this is getting off topic and it's moving away from form but i just wanted to highlight that in a way's attention to details and his approach to realistic character acting is something that is so precious I'm mostly going to be covering kind of similar points with Hiroyuki Okura who's also a very fantastic animator as well. In the case of Okura's animation something that I find super cool is that and this is more because smearing is a very prominent thing in animation right now in Japanese animation. It's almost a fundamental part of animation as is. There's nothing wrong with doing it but the thing is Okura when it comes to all of their running animation is that a lot of the time or more often than not they don't actually smear. It seems that they keep it to a minimum. If you shift your mind to your name and the very dramatic running scene, also one of my favorite moments within that film, you'll see that there are no smears, there are no extensions of movements, and smears, I wouldn't say personally, detract from realism necessarily, but 
a smear you could argue <laughs> in a very technical kind of literal sense is a distortion of form it's extending a movement for the purpose or for the animator's purpose of emphasizing the movement speed or force or anything that they think of and there is nothing wrong with doing it but it seems like Okura is reluctant to do it based on how much of it they've actually done but I think for your name this is actually quite a good thing if I explain really briefly and something I did touch on very slightly in the the aspect ratio is an episode which was absolutely ages ago, but uh, I'll just quickly rehash that argument that Shinkai uses these very realistic things. That term's going to get really old, but he uses these very realistic things for the purpose of bringing out what isn't real and what is fantasy. With the concept of your name being reliant on time and basically time travel and these time skips, not, not as scientific as it sounds, but his aesthetic and such pushes realism to the point to which when something is not real it feels magical honestly because it's penetrated this world which is built to look like ours and function pretty much like ours too. And so I think the goal in something like Hiroki Okura's animation is to maintain almost absolute realism at almost all costs <laughs> and when possible when drawing these characters and so when they're running with the sense of weight that Okura always manages to bring <laughs> almost regardless of the cut or the way in which the character sways all these things are important for reinforcing what Shinkai's vision uh, sort of unsaid vision is for his films. So in summary for this little imaginary bullet point, conforming to what we can consider normal forms of the human body and these normal representations of it, we can understand that form as an idea is important to anime because it can reinforce what the grand narrative of said anime is. In the case of Millennium Actress, it's to inspire its audience through the lens of Chiyoko and her struggle and her progression through her own life. And in, in the case of Kimono, no, it's it's to meet this boy once again and by and stop the meteor too <laughs> and so by tackling form in this way in this very orthodox fashion like Inoue and Okura in short we can keep the audience immersed within the real so let's move on to our second category and these are the form distorters I don't think I have as much to say for these two animators who I'm going to talk about mostly because their work kind of speaks for itself and the animators we have here are Shinya Ohira and Yutaro Kubo. I did read somewhere, I believe it was on my anime list, and I, I kind of believe it, but I also, uh, I'm not sure if I believe it, but I've heard somewhere, and if I'm remembering it correctly, it said that Shinya Ohira is potentially one of the most famous animators in the space of Japanese animation, and I don't know when that was written, and I would personally want to agree with it, but the extent to which I can agree with it is debatable, because it's not really commenting on influence but more so popularity and I think there are so many other popular animators with the anime of today that it's pretty hard to say that but with that being said I love both of these animators very much that's why I chose them and yes they are phenomenal at what they do I'm sure that Ohira is a name that people know a bit more than say Kubo but still both amazing and I'll try to convince you both why they're both very good animators and through the way in which they handle form. So just to go quickly back to the quote theory, as I said before, we can understand form as the composition, as size and shape of the body and how we handle that and how we change it around. And these are, unlike the more orthodox animators, these are two animators that are very willing to take these what we can consider normal and bend the rules they're able to break the traditional composition of the body and how it's set up because it's through this to which they can evoke certain emotions and communicate certain ideas the best way to really describe Ohira's work in my opinion is just chaos uh, but we shouldn't we shouldn't think of chaos as a bad thing chaos as a great thing because Ohira I think is 
personally one of the most unique animators of their time and within the Japanese animation space because they take such risks or not really risks because I'm sure that that's how they got there I don't think their work would be so risky to the point to which it wouldn't blend in with any other anime or any anime to exist that's why they're on anime obviously but they have they take a lot of liberties uh, let's just say that <laughs> When animating fabric in the body, often it's constantly morphing, sort of, it's moving inwards and outwards, it's expanding and contracting, it feels the body for once, unlike again the animators we spoke about before, feels active. It's not to say that the animators before didn't make the body seem active and alive, it, it always did, but this feels like it's the body itself physically is breathing, <laughs> it's full of life. It pretty much communicates ideas through our understanding of the shapes and sizes, so for example if I was to make the body much larger like what happens a lot in ping pong the animation, if I was to make <laughs> Smile's body 10 times larger than it already is, then what we associate with large is power and potentially might. And that's where the portrayal comes from, as opposed to these relatable portrayals like how we're swaying in to show our fear when we're running, for example. There's a difference there and it's it's very subtle, it's a bit more of a subtle difference or one that's pretty difficult to get one's head around. I'm struggling to get my head around it myself but I, when we get to know that then you can tell that there's quite a difference between how these animators try to portray sometimes the same thing but very differently. Ohira has really mastered the art of the drifting body, uh, as I like to call it. But more importantly, I think that Ohira's animation is very good in context rather than just in theory and, and through description. And in the context of something like Ping Pong the Animation, this is incredibly important. Something that I wasn't even able to describe properly all the way back to last year when I had that quote-unquote understanding sake episode that I really dislike now because I find it very inaccurate in some places and not really misleading but I think it misses a lot of the point. And yes, Ohira is great at meeting what Ping Pong the Animation is all about, which is about humans trying to interpret what it means to compete and what it means to compete against people who have different ideas of competition. It's as much as it is about Ping Pong, it's, I like to think of it as a clash of philosophies and ideas, but through sports. And <laughs> Uh, Ohira taps into that very well by basically displaying what this is all about and by representing what it means to compete through the flow of the body by having it constantly shaking and drifting around. We can imply feelings of excitement or nervousness or passion and concentration through just the body and how it moves and how it's composed by Ohira. His animation honestly speaks volumes for what this series is all about and I don't think <laughs> there are many people that would be able to do a better job of doing this than Ohira himself. Yuthiro Kubo is kind of different but also very similar when it comes to the talking points we touched on when it comes to Ohira. A lot of their animation and even some of their direction <laughs> relies on this constant movement. I say that very lightly because I never know a name for it. But when we have characters who, uh, yes they are still, but we have alternating drawings or alternating lines even when they're still, so it feels as if they're always moving, so they're technically moving but they're not, they're not physically deciding to walk, but their model is moving ever so slightly. Just like what we said before, I think that this can just breathe a lot of life into a narrative in a very subtle way, but in, in a good way nonetheless. I often do associate this with art house type films or indie anime, but it's not exclusive to this as well. Like we have Girl from the Other Side, which is partially directed by Yutaro Kubo. And this occurs all the way through, and this was done by Wit Studio, or done at least under Wit Studio, so there's nothing that can't be, this This isn't something that is exclusive to indie spaces, this is something which is in part being done in the mainstream, or, or at least within professional anime production.
If you've watched some of Kubo's maybe short films or, or you've seen their music video or the one that they were animation director on, I believe it, it's the music video for 2.43, the anime that just came out this season or just the volleyball anime. And when they do have the animated parts within it, because it is mostly live action, but when they have the animated parts within it, they never quite draw the human body in full. They usually, they draw with what looks like ink quite a lot of the time and a mix of ink and paint and it's constantly moving but they never really complete the entire form of the body and I kind of like this in a way. It's constantly moving and it feels very energetic and in a lot of cases it's great for demonstrating that humans uh, as he's animating are quite ambitious or multifaceted by putting together all these colors and even sometimes animating on what looks like uh, i didn't really know <laughs> what exact color it is but it's a type of yellow it's a very light yellow paper they seem to use a lot of the time by working on this and then having all these different colors from the rainbow or color wheel it looks as if he's implanting ambition uh, and just it feels like you're just putting in a burst of fun into the character even if it's not explicitly looking like fun i think that's what it communicates a lot of the time I don't want to get too lost within Kubo's work because I know that not everyone's so familiar with them and so instead I'll cut to the chase when it comes to these quote unquote form distorters. These animators that distort form are great because they're an example of what it means to go beyond realistic representations of the body. By transcending what we understand as the normative form we can express all kinds of ideas through how we perceive shape and size and motion, through exaggerating length and how whatever thing is extra long is moving or how little it's moving, we can just get a greater understanding of the feelings and emotions and ultimately ideas and concepts that an anime is communicating from the character level. Analyzing the form of characters is so important because it tells us a lot about not just the character themselves but the anime and its aesthetic approach and what it is trying to convey. I think that there's something that shape can do and size that uh, of objects and people that doesn't necessarily come through when you tell someone how somebody is feeling. These are almost visual shortcuts for getting to understand not just the character but what the director or writer is just trying to communicate with you. When we look back at animators like Okura and Inoue, like I mentioned in the beginning, this focus on very lifelike forms tells us quite a lot about the anime we're watching, which is about real people and real experiences, at least real from the perspective of within the film. And to get a real glimpse of the human experience and this person's experience, we have to show them as vulnerable and as normal as possible. They run the way we run, they breathe the way we breathe. And by interpreting them as who they are, and similarly to us it creates a connection with the film which we're watching and that's a connection that I personally felt when watching the work of Hiroyuki Okura in Your Name or the work of Toshiki Inoue or the work of Toshiki Inoue in The Millennium Actress. A final point and the biggest thing <laughs> if it was the only thing you could take away this is what it would be it's that we need to understand that animation is a part of storytelling i cannot stress that enough that animation is how we tell stories just as much as it is what is written i'm although as much as i push back on this term visual storytelling uh, okay i know i do push back on the term visual storytelling partially because it's turned into an empty word where anything that is visual <laughs> that looks nice is visual storytelling in some people's definition but I would personally say that I, I think it would be better if we understood storytelling as just a combination of both writing and visuals and by combining the two together to make storytelling we can learn quite a lot and I, I look back to works like ping pong the animation that do such a amazing things for this idea a lot of how ping pong is uh, i'll use the basic term narrated to us or at least how it's shown to us is through how we portray size and 
the way these characters morph sometimes when they're on the table tennis table and one is seen as really timid and one is seen as really big and we represent that through the size of the characters as they move across the table and try to win the match pretty much and I just look at anime like this and sometimes I get a bit frustrated that not because people aren't realizing it's good I, I know ping pong has so much recognition that's not the point here but it's so much more than just its symbolism and how it's written and such it's how it shows the body the body being the mechanism for sports and stuff like that and so what I'm trying to say in summary is that we have to, in order to look at anime in this analytical way it would be a disservice to not look at form because form is the form of the character and how they're animated the fundamental pieces of the narrative a lot of the time, characters, how they are animated can tell us a lot about the rest of the story which is being told to us. In order to analyse storytelling within anime, we have to look at how forms are portrayed and how the body is portrayed will tell us a lot about the anime that is to follow. Thank you for listening to Guests in the Mecca. That has been episode 87 and I hope you did enjoy this one. I'm not, I wasn't going to do closing thoughts just because that was basically a closing thoughts segment. So I thought I'd just end it here nice and smoothly while I had the momentum there. This episode, I'll be honest, was a bit hard to do in practice. <laughs> I think it was very easy to write this one down and so I can understand if this episode was a bit cumbersome to listen to because I am talking about animation in a very animation-y way that would probably be better in a video than a podcast, but it, you live and learn and that's the thing with this podcast. If you did enjoy this episode and you want to support the podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can leave it a review on Apple Podcasts. That'll probably be the most appreciated thing you can do as it helps me algorithmically and stuff. You can go onto YouTube and subscribe and like the video and comment on the video and turn on the notifications for the videos too. It's a lot of stuff, I'm sorry, but if you really like the podcast, I upload the podcast onto YouTube every Saturday at six o'clock my time or um, UK time. Um, I don't know how that translates into other time zones. I, in America, I'm sure that's just Saturday afternoon or something like that. Usually very consistent. So if you want to listen there, then that's the place to be. You can also follow me on Twitter at GetInTheMecca. I tweet a lot about animation and things that I don't get to talk about on the podcast. And yeah, it's a good time. Uh, follow me on Twitter. And then finally, tell a friend about this podcast. If you could tell one friend about Get the Mecca, that would do wonders, honestly, for the show. Last episode did so well, so I am very thankful for all the support. I didn't expect this Jujutsu Kaisen episode that I kind of threw together randomly because the show was ending. I just thought, okay, let's just do it. And it did. It was probably one of the best episodes I've ever done uh, from what the analytics are showing. So thank you so much for the support and any additional support is also very appreciated too. So that's it for this week. I know this one's going to be a bit of a titan to edit. So let me just get wrapped up now. Have a great weekend. Please stay safe. I have been your host Shimar today and this has been Get in the Mecca. The music in this production goes as follows. Synthwave by Alex. By Alex McCulloch. Mandatory Overtime by Joth. And Anomaly by Eric Medea's undersoundimage.org.